So welcome everybody to today's Connexus Thursday talk. Happy International Day of Peace. Today's <clears throat> topic is how can we effectively use evidence in peace building project design? Joined today by Ruth Alec Rhodes of CDA Collaborative Learning and David Connolly of the US Institute for Peace. I'll go ahead and hand it over to Ruth and David. Welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sander. And uh, to all of you who have uh, made the time to join this session. So I just wanna start by outlining the reasons for the evidence review that we're here to talk about today. And as a reminder of the question that, that we focused on for the evidence review, as Xander mentioned, what constitutes effective use of evidence to inform project design and peace building? And I want to explain how it became part of a whole of institute initiative at USIP back in 2020. I then want to explain how the evidence review has helped shape what we're now doing at the institute, which we are calling our learning agenda which involves designing new practitioner tools while at the same time asking what are the priority evidence gaps that we at USIP need to address in order to improve practice. So to start with the origins, often difficult to pinpoint a, a single inception point, uh, but I've chosen when our former president and CEO, Nancy Lindbergh, back in 2020, asked us to design a conflict analysis tool for USIP program teams. Our first thought was to design a conflict assessment framework or CAF, which are typically known as. And these CAFs, conflict assessment frameworks, have been used by USAID and state and most donor states for more than 20 years. But when we consulted with programs here at USIP, but also several outside experts, so that includes experts such as Rebecca Wolf and Sharon Morris, we concluded that the conflict assessment framework model was not the right one for our needs here at USIP. Why? Well, conflict assessment frameworks or CAFs, they tend to operate at national level, whereas USIP projects tend to be localized and micro. We don't operate at scale here at USIP. The second conflict assessment frameworks, they're quite rigid and linear, whereas USIP needs to be more nimble and adaptive. So overall, the, the CAF model would have created a gulf between the level and type of evidence gathered and the main needs of our program teams, which essentially is to design and adapt projects in complex environments. Okay, so parallel to this process, we're still in 2020. At the Institute, we launched a separate whole of Institute initiative, which we called the Toolbox Project. This is under the leadership of Vice Presidents David Yang and Joe Hewitt. And the Toolbox Project set out to really improve the links between evidence and our peace building work. To do that, we commissioned 12 evidence reviews, one for each of our main thematic areas. And these areas included facilitating track to dialogue, reconciliation, but also cross-cutting themes such as women, peace and security, and our diagnostic tools, which included conflict analysis. By 2023, this year, all 12, 12 evidence reviews had been completed and in collaboration with many of the top researchers in our peace building field. And we adopted a systematic review methodology for the evidence reviews, which you may be aware already is very common in the health sciences and education, but less so in the field of peace building. So for the evidence review and conflict analysis, we hit a wall right from the start because our initial thought was to set out and do a review of other conflict analyses by different organizations in our field, both government and non-governmental. Non but the challenge there is these conflict analyses, they're not so easily available. So instead, we designed a research question which addressed a more practical question that was central to the design of our conflict analysis tool, which was what constitutes effective use of evidence to inform peace building to inform project design in peace building. We worked with CDA, Ruth is with us today, also colleagues uh, at CDA, Pushpa Ayer and Lily Reese to undertake the review, which involved the metasynthesis of the relevant literature, but also three round tables with practitioners and researchers, and then a set of case studies involving a selection of USIP 
program teams. Last, and right on this slide, I want to wrap up by highlighting where we are now. And so in 2023, we launched the Institute's Learning Agenda, and that involves, as you can see here, a cycle of three main components. So first of all, as we're doing today, to disseminate the 12 evidence reviews in different ways. Second, with our thematic and regional teams to design new tools based on the findings from the evidence reviews and to provide resources to accompany the new tools. So currently we're developing tools for dialogue, systems thinking, and especially relevant for our talk today, next month we are gonna launch the USIP programmatic conflict analysis tool. When we talk about tools, I mean, I realize people, we can use that in different ways. Examples of tools in this context of our learning agenda are, are things like practitioner guidelines, protocols, maybe a policy approach, or framework, or a training course. So we're quite open in how we define uh, tools here. The, the third uh, part of the cycle is to identify then, so what are the next questions that we need to do research on? Um, in other words, what are the key evidence gaps that we need to fill to be more effective practitioners? So before handing to Ruth, I just wanna pull out what are the main drivers of this process so far? That is the process to design an evidence-based conflict analysis tool. Well, first, as I said, right at the start, it was that crucial demand signal from leadership. Second, we couldn't have done any, any of this without the active support of our thematic teams here and our regional teams to keep us focused on the so what. And then third, also crucial, collaborating with external experts like Ruth and CDA amongst many others. That was, that was essential. And last, a willingness to learn and adapt because as, as I have referenced several times, where we, where we are now, where we've ended up, both in the evidence review, the question that we ended up asking, but also the type of tool that we set out to design was completely different from what we initially set out to do. And that required uh, a willingness, of course, to, to be adaptive, but also to, to learn, and as we're doing today, to share, share those lessons with experts. So with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Ruth. Thanks, David. Thanks, Xander. Thanks to Conexus and to our, our group here today. I'm really excited looking at the attendees list to see a lot of new names. And so wanted to start off by seeing if we could hear from you about what brings you here today. So pop a note in the chat or come off mute for just a second, just a couple of words to say, you know, why of the many, many, many things that you were invited to today on International um, Day of Peace, you chose this one. Go ahead and raise your hand that I can uh, unmute you if you'd like to share. If you think you might be calling from the furthest time zone away from U.S. East Coast time. We'd love to hear from you. Carol or Luis or Anne, whoever's first to the mic. Hi, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> My name is Hi. Luis Monroy. I'm writing from uh, the Atlantic coast in Colombia. I'm a peace building researcher. I'm interested in reconciliation and transitional justice, but I'm currently uh, working on a project looking at programmatic learning. So I'm really interested to see how peace building organizations are approaching learning, if that is a short term, medium term, or long term approach. What tools, what advice are you giving policymakers, uh, practitioners? And you know what 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 are the variety of approaches out there in the field in different countries, different organizations? Oh my goodness, this webinar is not going to be long enough. Let's be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, oh, will do. Very good. Anyone else? Yes, hi, I'm Carol from Cry Peace in Canada, and I'm about to launch a peace curriculum, a proven peace curriculum developed in Uganda. I'm going to relaunch it in the Congo, and I need some baseline and evaluation tools for it. Fascinating, great, really good to know. There are lots of good options. Well, I'd appreciate some tips beyond the toolbox if you've got any recommendations. Happy to do, yeah. Maybe one more. We have Anne Devar or Nawaz. Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. This is Haq Nawaz Haqiar, the mini manager from Afghanistan. So I was quite interested to join this session in order to know about what evidence USAP uses 
especially for the conflict and, uh, and what indicators and tools they use in these kind of reports because right now uh, we have got several projects in Afghanistan you would like to know how can we uh, report evidence based and have some clues from uh, this session thanks Fantastic. I love that range of, of interests. There are people who are doing research, there are people who are working on course curriculum, there are people who are implementing programs and wanting to understand evidence. I think that's one of the things that we loved about this project was just hearing all the different ways that our field prioritizes evidence and is really leaning into being evidence-based and evidence-informed. So we'll go into, into the project and then have plenty of time to come back to others who might have had their hands raised or wanted to, to contribute. So David put forward this question, you know, what constitutes effective use of evidence to inform peace building project design? It's a big question. And when I think about it, it's been part of my whole career from graduate school in Kenya to being an implementer and a program designer with Mercy Corps or in my role now as a researcher and network weaver through CDA Collaborative Learning. But what, what's really at the heart of this question is this, this goal. So, you know, that peace building initiatives have the greatest chance of positive impact for people experiencing or threatened by conflict, right? That's what we're all trying to do. And so if we think at the at the meta level of research as David was describing and conflict analysis, that gives us one piece of the of the um, picture, one piece of the puzzle. But at the programmatic level where designers are adapting, are creating new initiatives all the time, what really matters at that level for evidence? So we took a an approach that you know, we were interested in, in how can we make this research practical and how can we break this gigantic question down into component parts? And so when I say we, I also want to recognize Push Payir, who is an expert in decolonizing peace building field and also in research and evidence, and also Lily Riss, who is an expert in dm &E. What we did was, when I thought about how to present this, we really took a theory of change approach. You know, So some of our questions and research steps in our mixed methods approach were trying to understand you know, why and in what circumstances evidence is effective. So we talked, we did a total literature review that pushed Bilad that really looked at the, the information that's out there that's both published, and we tried to find as many unpublished sources as possible. And, and we'll talk about the findings in just a second. We also really wanted to understand on a practical level, how can we support people in positions to design peace building programs? How can we support them to plan for, actually do the, the, the data collection, the evidence generation, and recognize evidence? And we'll talk a little bit more about that what when you aren't necessarily seeking a particular kind of evidence, how can you recognize something's important for your peace building project design? And then that can um, move us into evidence informed design. And we'll make a distinction in a minute about evidence based versus evidence informed. And that equips us to have context responsive, adaptive learning as part of program design and into into adaptation. So that's our kind of logic path, both for the research and for getting from this big question to this ultimate goal. All righty. So what did we learn? And I promise we won't go through this whole slide, but we wanted to present a lot of the information so that um, when we share these slides out with, to everyone, that you'll have um, a good summary of, of our findings. But I'll, I'll highlight three. <clears throat> so again, we, we did a metasynthesis we talked to dozens of experts, and by experts, we mean local peace builders and people who are working outside of their country of origin, you know, international peace builders who are in design positions, academic researchers, policymakers, just tried to get a 360 perspective with our, our roundtables that, that helped inform this research. And we used a force field analysis approach to say, what are the factors for and against 
thinking about how you used it. Uh, we also did a case study that focused on two different USIP country contexts where designers were in the position to need to derive, use evidence in their, their program design and what some of their limitations were as well as what kind of evidence that they valued. So we took all of those different um, sources of information and conversations and came up with a, a number of lessons and also wanted to map them to, to the implications. But one of the things that we're seeing across the whether it's donors or policymakers, international organizations, local organizations, everybody is interested in more evidence-based practices. So the demand is coming both from the top down and bottom up, which means that this conversation is really timely for our field to think about what that means for, for our action. Another thing that I'll uh, highlight there is that people who are designing programs understand the role of evidence in their work. So it's valued, and but it's only able to be pursued if there's this perfect storm of time, resources, expertise. And so that means that standard practices aren't often um, created, um, best practices aren't often used. It's a kind of an as needed um, approach in a lot of ways. I'll also emphasize on the last one that the evidence that people valued most across the board, all the different um, forms of research that we did was local and situationally specific. So that evidence that's generated within context, interpreted within a context and put into practice, reinvented, that that can be relevant in that space, but also generalizable in other spaces as a means to understanding other local evidence. So happy to, to unpack that a little bit, but I want to pause here and David welcome you if there were things that were exciting for, for USIP related to any of these lessons or, or implications. Yeah, no, thanks for, for highlighting these. And I think it's useful to have both, both the lessons on, on the one side and, 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 and the implications. I think, you know, linked to the last one you mentioned, I think on, on the, the type of evidence, um, you mentioned there, Ruth, yeah, you know, localized, absolutely, but also, you know, I think uh, a useful distinction is between formal and informal uh, types of, of, of evidence. And, and sometimes, I mean, it's hard to generalize, but sometimes perhaps, especially more on the research side, we would, we would, we would prioritize leaning more towards what we would consider sort of formal uh, types of evidence, uh, such as this one here, right? The evidence review, um, impact evaluations, et cetera. And while that is the case, um, uh, our study found that yes, they are indeed uh, influential. It's, it's important to consider that that's not the only type of evidence. And actually, you know, the, you know, the assumption I think by many that, that you know, there's sort of a hierarchy of evidence with, with the sort of the impact evaluations at the top and other sort of less formal types of evidence at the bottom um, we find that not to be the case. Um, so when you talk to practitioners um, who are active, you know, at, at that sort of local level, um, they don't necessarily have that that sense of hierarchy of evidence. And and as you said, it really depends on the situation, and it depends on that good judgment, um, both of the researchers and and the practitioners. Yeah, thanks, thanks, David. Fully agreed. It's almost as if our assumption is inverted. You know that that you know when you're in need of timely information in order to adapt a program. It's very logical that you're looking very close to where you are. And instead of looking to the randomized control trial that happened, you know, eight months earlier and was peer reviewed and published, you know, that's important too. But what designers are telling us is most valued for their real-time design work is much more that local and situationally specific evidence. So, yep. you know, we can come back to this slide and um, look through some of the, the questions that you might have. But overall, the fact that this is a really understudied area within the peace building field means that there's a lot of policy decision-making, resource decision-making, 
organizational approaches and, and those decisions that are just under supported as far as from an evidence-based decision-making perspective. So this is, is something we know sort of at a um, intellectual level or, or experiential level, but it's really nice to have um, the input of practitioners and um, policymakers to say, no, that's, that's real and an important um, thing that we need to address. So two quotes, um, you know, David and I've kind of highlighted two key findings for effective peace building project design and, you know, among the many others, really want to, for this audience, engage you all with this idea of shifting from evidence-based to evidence-informed and also the value of local evidence. And, you know, evidence-based is where we started with the research and is what the the field generally uses as a as a term understanding the difference between you know to the extent to which a project design is based in specific evidence or is looking at lots of different types of evidence and is informed by the sum total with preference for things that are coming from people who would be directly affected by the programming. So that's the shift from being evidence-based, very almost in a, in a rigid scientific method way, to being evidence-informed in a systems perspective and adaptation way. And I really appreciated in our roundtables, one of the, the quotes that kind of took all the air out of the room was like, oh, Oh, that's interesting. You know, the paradoxes that exist in reality, the evidence really should always see those, which means that, you know, which piece of evidence at which given time is most important, that's going to have to be part of the, the DNA, the practice and expertise of peace builders doing design work to understand how to use evidence in an effective way at a given time. I also really appreciated, as part of the USIP case study, just the really honest reflections that we heard that the, the network of partners and their staff in the context where they're working, the, those relationships are what they trust most when they need to think about the evidence to use in their program design with those partners and in, in other design settings. So again, we can come back to any of these, these slides, but we'll, we'll share one more, just where we are with the challenges identified through the evidence review and some of the ideas for action. So the, of the four challenges, Really, a lot of these are not, you know, silver bullets uh, to make um, change in a really easy way. They're much more mindset uh, shifts or organizational investment shifts. Um, thinking about the practicality of making sure that people who are in design positions have the skill set and the support, the organizational support and the operational means to use evidence-informed practices and also creating that that ecosystem where you know any one organization you know USIP colleagues in design positions were telling us this and David's point that USIP is working at a at a very project level not in at scale across the country but is looking across the country what is that ecosystem and this is something that that CDA would call difference between piece writ little and piece writ large so on a on a project level you can have great impact in all the, the measures that, that you set out to, to achieve, but how is it connected up to all the other peace building programs or initiatives that have peace building goals or addressing the conflict context goals? How do you, how do you map to those in order to have something that's greater than the sum of the parts? And that would be the peace writ large level. So that, that ecosystem really being, being important. So that's really where our key recommendation is, both for organizations that are practitioners and researchers, designers, as well as donors to really invest in those structural, operational, and especially cultural levels of organizations to understand the value of, and not just have lip service about the value of being evidence-based or evidence-informed, but actually supporting and in creating that enabling environment. We also identified a number of areas that need a lot more research, um, and among them, just 
what are the mechanisms, again, operationally, structurally, culturally, to more fully integrate local knowledge? You know, if we say that we want to localize or be locally led, what does that actually mean for evidence and how we generate evidence, how we respect evidence, how we invite evidence, and how we analyze and who gets to analyze, all of that. So a number of other um, areas for, for scrutiny that we think that the, the larger peace building field could, could take on. But we'll leave it there as far as the formal part of the presentation. David and my email addresses are here. The link um, that Xander put into the, the chat as well is to the larger USIP learning agenda where this um, research is one of several. Um, and then CDA's research that's relevant, um, some of which I've referenced, is all at, at our website. So, oh, I am seeing in the chat, continue to share from the chat. Um, happy to catch up with the chat. Maybe if, if okay, I see Lauren's question first, and then Anne, Michael, and Ellie. Yeah, I, so, it, I can jump in if that's okay. Please, Ruth, I, that's brilliant. As, as you were presenting, I, I had the time to, to look up on the chat and yeah, so many excellent Thank questions you. there, but all of them jumped out at me, but and I also I think Lauren's maybe was, the, was the, one of the first anyway, but yeah, Lauren, I mean, that's something we did actually at US, just to be like, I'll try and be brief, but maybe like three years ago. So, so your questions about project design and how can we better support teams? And it's been kind of a work in progress here for about seven years, but, but about three years ago, we decided to sort of move the needle on it here. And what we did was we just, we broke up, it sounds very simple and it, you know, on, on one level it was very simple, but we broke up, sort of broke down the different stages. We call them steps within a, with a what, are, what are the different steps within USIP projects anyway? You know, from right from the, from the design stage, or, you know, th through to, yeah, you know, de developing a, a kind of a male framework and, and, and then, you know, actually starting the project. So, so we, we so we broke it up for colleagues because even though on one level they know it, they just don't have the time to, to sort of do what we did and, and sort of break it up into stages and then offer very, very specific technical guidance for each one of those little micro stages. And that, that has been very, as I say, sounds very simple. It took us a long time to do it, but to, just by breaking down each stage and therefore knowing, I mean, this is just for USIP, of course, but it will vary from, your, I think your conciliation resources, um, of course, there'll be similarities, but but it was very specific to the USIP type of projects, and and that was well received by our sort of program our program teams. They and, and they use it, and you know we can track how often it is used. So that that was three years ago, but you know it's 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 my last point is it never ends in a good way. I mean, just last week I was thinking, okay, so we did that three years ago, and, and yes, it was very successful. So what next? You know what's the next step and obviously you know the, the tool that i mentioned this conflict analysis tool that that has come out of this whole evidence review process that we're launching next month for sure that's going to be part of the the project design stage and and, the, and sort of adapting uh projects but we're, we're constantly asking and i'm sure you too lauren as well at, at, at cr you know once you get to a certain level and supporting colleagues then you're thinking okay so so what next H happy to talk further about that but uh, maybe back to you ruth any questions you would like to pick up on? Yeah, David, I, I'm, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the programmatic conflict analysis tool because I think it it actually responds to some of the questions in the chat that it it helps like the the approach is to say why do you need to do conflict analysis? You know, are you doing something for programmatic design or for understanding how your programmatic work is progressing or are you doing it basically as a as a large review in order to inform strategy that might eventually come to programmatic activities so it really is in in some ways a decision tree where you start with you know what question you're trying to answer what um, need you're trying to address and then following that to the types of analysis questions and tools that you could use that already exist or how or recommendations about how to combine those tools into something that's fit for purpose for you and then that leads into the conversation about indicators that are appropriate or learning agendas that might be designed and you know tries to be very 
you know, from the universe of conflict analysis tools and the universe of indicators, it tries to help practitioners narrow their focus to what's really useful for them in their context and their need. And you know, I have to, to commend USIP for having that vision because it really does fill a gap. I think you know one of the other findings that that this evidence review had was that practitioners are busy. That isn't a finding, but we know that. But what that the implication of that is is that they rely on what they know, which you know maybe somebody is implementing a program for a new organization that they've just joined and haven't got gotten sort of up to speed on the conflict analysis or assessment tools that their their new organization uses, they revert back to what they might have used at their previous organization or what they got trained on at one point when they were early in their career. So it's very ad hoc and just in time. And that is what we're trying to address to bring some more systematic learning about and use of best practices in the the field so that evidence use whether it's generated through conflict analysis or conflict assessment or any other forms that it that there's a more robust structure for yeah. using evidence and um fi- and, and translating that into indicators or plans yeah is that a fair yeah, it is. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say it better. So I'm definitely not going to repeat it. I just, I just want to pull out two things there because they're, they're super important. One is, yes, we, we adopted this decision tree model because it's quite, when you're in that sort of design phase, you, you know, there's a danger of being too abstract and sort of losing everybody. And instead we, we took this very practical, I think for sure it's, it's, it's a, it's something that everybody can relate to you know, a kind of a decision tree, sort of step-by-step walking our guiding colleagues through, in this case, you know, how do you, how do you design a project and the type of conflict analysis. So, th- so, so that was key. And then your second point, which is related, you know, like here, here at the Institute, and maybe others can relate to this, like if, if our team went off, and even if we designed like the best, most amazing tool ever, and sort of tried to inject it into practice here, chances are it would just fail because you just, I mean, you just have to include the users, if we can use that term, of this tool eventually. You have to include them from the start. You have to include them in really creative ways so that by the time you, you get to the design of the, the whatever tool, your, your, your program colleagues, they're part of it, you know, and, and yes, some introductions need to be done, but, but you know, as we have done here, Ruth, with the tool we've designed, I mean, I, I've lost count on maybe like, at least six or seven teams here at the USIP have been involved in the design of that. So, so hopefully that that will make the this, the you know the, this kind of the take up of it. It will make it more smoother and the kind of the rollout of it. But yes, the decision making tool that was the kind of the central part of it. And then and then trying to improve practice by by helping colleagues just be a little bit more systematic in how they do it. Thank you so much, Ruth and David. This is exactly why I've been excited for this session all summer. Um, especially switching gears partially from the, the sort of practitioner world to the academic world myself. So this is the perfect um, conversation for today. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A function already. A reminder for people who are holding on to questions. These are recorded and posted on Connexus. If you ask a question and need sort of your your voice or your section edited out for safety, security, privacy reasons, feel free to just email me and we can take care of that. We don't want that to be a barrier to participation. I think looking through, we're gonna go from Alex and then to Nabil afterwards. My, My question, was posed around the type of evidence that you were, I was wondering, you at some point mentioned you also looked at unpublished evidence, but by saying that, I presume that the majority of your evidence was published. In other words, it was probably academic research. In other words, this kind of, you were, you were basing your evidence resource or the, the resource base for your review on, let's say, one type of epistemology, which is a kind of, I suppose, 
yeah, academic focus. But in my experience, especially if you want to get contextualized and what you were saying in terms of the learning, the more, I suppose, real life examples of evidence, they more often than not are not found in academic research or they are, but they're so uh, subliminal that maybe the, the essence is uh, diluted or gone even. But yeah, other ways of knowing strike me as maybe really, yeah. really interesting here. So I wonder what you came up with. What did you, did you find any other types of evidence? So yeah, thank you so great much. question. I, Go sorry, ahead. I, yeah. I, knew, I, knew, I knew both of us would want to answer that question first, but- Go for it, um, no, please. Sorry, Ruth, maybe I'm more determined than you are. Great question, just some succinct points. You're absolutely right. You know, we, in, in the sense that we, we, all of the evidence reviews, not just done, not just the one conflict analysis had this, this sort of issue or challenge because yes, we, we did want to do, as I mentioned, we're, we're adopting, you know, a kind of a rigorous academic, you know, research method, right? The, the, the systematic review methodology. <clears throat> we definitely wanted to embrace that, but at the same time, and this is for all 12 of the evidence reviews, we knew that that would not be enough. Um, and I mean, again, there's, there's good literature on this. We weren't the first organization to have this challenge. What I mean is that we had to include engagement or data collection with, with practitioners. So, so we, so that, that, that's that review that, you know, the review of the, the systematic review of, of, of the evidence, which to answer your question was yes, ac you know, sort of academic publications, but also and please go to our report. We're very transparent about the whole methodology and of course the sources used, but, but not only academic sources, but at the same time, yes, we had to fill a gap even just beyond those sources and that involved engaging with the practitioners. So I, I could say more, but I won't, Ruth, hopefully yeah. I have some things out you want to add. <laughs> No, absolutely. The the metasynthesis that was was done looked at a number of academic resources, but it also looked at organizations published evaluations or reflections about evidence use. And we as a peace building field are not incredibly forthcoming with that information. It's often kept quite private and we package things in a way that, you know, shows impact as opposed to the challenges of use of evidence and so you know that's something where we really had to dig in and one of our findings was that they're just it's it's an understudied area and an under it's just an intransparent area so we even we spent a lot of time asking our roundtable participants just in their own reflections to say great you know you're referencing a decision-making process that your team went through in designing a peace building program in South Sudan. Ruth, I think you froze right as you were making a really good point. All right, I think we'll revisit that point, but I think Naveel's question was fairly um, in line with this as well. So my questions are around mostly around evidence collection. So how do evaluators collect the evidence during the time of conflict and how does it remain relevant in the life cycle of a conflict. Yes, you do the conflict analysis, but you've taken the data at a certain point in time. How is it relevant six months from now, one year from now, given that the life cycle of a conflict, which may be long drawn, it could change the dynamics of the conflict itself. So that's my first question. And the second thing is around policy making. We've talked a lot about local data collection. So when you do local data collection, and I'll talk from Pakistan is where I come from, how do you scope out to the, to the district and the province and the national level? Because we don't have decentralization the way that we want decentralization. So most of the policy making is done at the central level. So how does local perspectives or local voices, do they remain in the perspective or they get lost when you try to aggregate at a national level? That, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nabil. Great questions. Definitely the first one was is very relevant, not, not just to this evidence review and, and the conflict analysis tool that I mentioned we're going to launch uh, next month, but just the everyday practice, you know, here at USIP, less so in DC where I'm right now, but obviously colleagues who are in, in the countries where, where, we, where we operate. So I would say that, yes, you know, another, if I had to play back your question, you know, how do you keep conflict, your conflict and how do you keep it updated? conflict analysis and the first my first part answer is I think that, that you know the level 
at which you're doing the conflict analysis matters a lot in, in answering that question. So and that really gets to the heart of, of what we were doing in this evidence review and the tool we're producing. As I mentioned, you know, just by the nature of USIP's work, we are operating at a very local micro level. Of course, our teams are doing that sort of macro national um, analysis. They're, they're maybe uh, doing it obviously when, when needed, but let's say certainly less frequently than the type of analysis that they're doing at that micro level. And that's something which, which we found, we found that, and we were happy to sort of give visibility to that, that, you know, USIP teams are doing that, that micro level analysis, you know, pretty much every day, right? And uh, not that they're, they're sitting doing a formal study every day, but it's just part of their practice that, that they are doing that analysis and then trying to then use the analysis to inform and to adapt their projects. And that, that's the kind of the nexus that this tool wants to try and provide better support for, right? Because that's difficult, especially in a, in a you know in a very challenging you know environment, conflict affected environment. So so that's that's the that's the support that we're trying to really zero in on, you know, helping colleagues to to keep doing that that sort of regular analysis at that micro level, but then finding a way for them to feed it into the design. So I think your your first question really goes right to the heart of of, the, of this initiative. And I'm so glad you asked it. Your second question, maybe I'd feel less. And, and Ruth, uh, please jump in if I'm not sure if you, you heard the second question. I mean, it's a great question. I totally, I totally get it. And, and that is that sort of dissonance between, you know, let's say communities, people at that sort of local level who aren't in a, in a decentralized, you know, some sort of country context, whereas sort of decision making, especially you mentioned that being on policy making, it's, it's very centralized. It's happening at that, at that national level. I mean, I'll just offer one response is that, that, and I mean, that's a very complex picture that you painted. So this would be a very, you know, small, modest step that, that by, by, of course, by doing research, and this is over a long period of time, especially participatory research, um, even just conflict analysis, where, where, where the environments, you know, allow it. I mean, over time, that can be a small part, but nonetheless, it, it can play a part in trying to close that gap. So that, that's something I've just seen in, in, in my own experience. But Ruth, I'm not sure you heard Nabil's original question. If you I, haven't, then please say. Apologies, not quite sure what happened there, but I'm glad to be back. Glad, no one on this call has ever experienced that before, of course. <laughs> I didn't hear the original question, but um, based on your response, uh, yeah, concur there. Um, and I don't know, apologies for, for dropping out uh, mid-response mid earlier on. So if there's a follow-up, I'm happy to do that. But I guess a follow-up to me is, Nabil, um, I, I know you mentioned you're, you're, you're from Pakistan, and I, I, I assume that's the context you're referring to in this question. But, I'm, I'm, but my follow-up to you is, like, in, in that, whether it's Pakistan or another context you're thinking about, okay, so formally you have that, that gulf, that gap, right, between sort of central level to local level, but what sort of processes informally are happening in between? I mean, I assume it's not just a complete void, right? I assume, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, that there are all sorts of different types of processes, whether by civil society and otherwise, which are which are actually happening. And, and my question there, if, if that's the case, then to what extent is there potential to to you know to, to use those or, or you know to, to be part of those those processes in trying to influence influence the decision making at that national level? That be the sorry, does that follow up make sense? Please tell me if it, it does, but but see the thing is it's it's more around like you know mobilization of resources. So yes, civil society and local leadership will get together, but the response from the state may take time to come through because yeah. they're thinking more at like how do we do this, how do we go, and then it you know in in release of some of the funds that get from the national level to the provincial to the local level, it like yeah. they do have district, but if if it's beyond the the budget of the district. It's going to take a while for that mobilization to happen and during that time the conflict is worsening right so yeah. so how do you ma manage some of those needs of the local people and then focus on like you know if it's happening at a district level and if it has the potential to expand to district and to provinces as well no, i get i get it i mean I think we, and it's, and it's, sorry, just very briefly was we were we were thinking about just here at the institute what we've called sort of the meso level and you mentioned there sort of district and you know that can mean different things in different contexts but but i mean i just listening to you talk nabil 
it's so important in many of those contexts, what I would call that meso level, sort of the in-between level, um, especially as you say, in a context where, where, where there is that, that, that sort of formal gap or gap within the state. But Ruth, sorry, you wanted to, to add? No, I was just going to invite if if others who um, you know are in contexts that have have figured out some of these local to national level channels of communication about real time evidence. I know that you know we're experiencing this in programs with Sudan right now, and finding some of those channels so that there is more actionable real-time evidence use and being evidence informed you know are, are there others on this call that are are um, listening to this and saying oh that reminds me of a of a channel that we've really developed in our country yeah feel free to raise your hand if you want to jump in on that also if you're listening to this months later please email us yeah <laughs> because i don't want to solve the issue by then <laughs> I'm not seeing him. Okay, that's fine. I'd be really curious though. So so we'll make sure that our email addresses are are accessible to you because that would be a really important follow-up, both I mean for USIP and for CDA and some of our, our ongoing partnerships and learning. Looking at the other questions and also the time, I think we'll go to Carol and then I think Ellie and Luisa's questions might be combinable afterwards. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So I wanted to follow up on first, I wanted to check, are you publishing a tool on how to design um, evidence uh, research in our projects? One need that I have as a small NGO um, is really support in this. If you guys could have some think tanks about how can we support NGOs that don't have the internal teams and resources so that we can do our best at gathering evidence and using evidence-informed programs? That would be really helpful. So are you publishing anything like that? Yeah. And, um, and do you have any recommendations specifically for how to evaluate a peace curriculum for secondary school students? Okay, no, thanks. Two, very, two, two great questions, very different. So yes, we, we are... Uh, uh, definitely publishing this and sharing it with the, the peace building community. So, so this year coming, so for us, which is October to, to next September, that sort of fiscal year, what we're focused on is sort of rolling that tool out at USIP. We've already piloted it, this, this conflict analysis tool and, and, and linking evidence to pr project design. But we do feel a responsibility to actually roll it out here first and then publish it so, so definitely this time next year. So, sorry, a bit of a, a wait. For now, of course, we do have the all twelve evidence reviews on uh, on our website, and I'm happy, you know, to 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 you know continue by email or whatever to to, to provide the support on the education. Ruth, I I can I can say a little there, but maybe you want to chime in first. Yeah, happy to do. I think two different responses. You know, our evidence review didn't look specifically at education resources, but there are a lot of great people who are and organizations that are members of the Alliance for Peacebuilding or who have their resources on this Connects Us platform. But two that I'll mention at the across to East Africa and part of a global network, a woman named Judith Peet is looking at the bridge from the bridge into peace programming in at the university level. So the types of information that secondary students have and then would need at the at the college level. Um, and also the Rotary Center, the peace centers around the world are really advanced on this and thinking that that there's a lot there that could be adapted at the universe or at the secondary school level. So yeah, I, I would Definitely put the put the Rotary Centers and Judith Pete on your outreach list. Oh, actually, that's a great tip. I've applied to the Macquarie um, Rotary Peace Center, so hopefully I'll be be able to join their next program. But if not, just to get some resources for them, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's try and do this quickly. <laughs> Sorry, I, I promised that we try and finish by the end of the hour, but these are two really good questions. Ellie, do you want to jump in? And then Luis, do you want to jump in right after? And then we can sort of turn that into to last thoughts, because I think they fit pretty well. 
Uh, thank you. I think my question has been answered already because I saw the tail end of uh, the presentation by Ruth. And I think uh, one, one of the statements that say that the evidence should always see the paradoxes that exist in reality, I think it just ties into what I was going to ask. So I have no further questions. Perfect. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Luis, do you want to jump in? Sure, sure. Sorry, I wasn't able to uh, unmute myself. So thank you for great insights, because my research is taking me through terms like decolonial approaches and avoiding the romanticization of the local and uh, co-creation. I want to ask, what do these terms mean for you and how important are they? I mean, what is what what is taking a co-creative approach, a decolonial approach? What What does that entail for what you've been researching? I'm happy to jump in and then David let you have the last word, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, Ellie, it's great to hear your voice and um, appreciate your work. The I think the the highlighting the piece about the paradoxes is really important and in the, the need for systems thinkers who are bringing that lens into the policy space and challenging policymakers to think systemic too. So that's that's one plug. The the other Luis, to your question, I would really encourage you to follow up with Push by Year, the co-author the this is her area of expertise and deep thinking from both a South-South perspective as well as a, a majority world, minority world um, vantage points. And but I think in my own experience with this research, with other research I've been involved with, with program design, it's really about authentic relationships and trust-based relationships. And so if you're taking a decolonized approach or a co-creation approach, you know, that's not something you can read in a book. That's not something you can follow step by step. That needs to be part of your mentality and part of your curiosity and your way of being in relationship with people. And, and that's something that I think we don't do enough work on for as when we're sending people into situations where they're designing peace building programs or responding to the needs of people in their own context who are designing peace building programs or doing research is just that, you know, bringing, bringing the human connection back to the center and that that is what will help us decolonize and co-create in a more authentic and impactful way, ultimately. Yeah, thanks. I just very briefly, Xander, to have like 30 seconds. But right, thanks. So I don't. I do. Okay. Anyway, I'll try. So great question. I, I I think they do. Of course, they they mean something. You said you're coming from a research background. You're researching these terms. That that that's that's super important. I would encourage you as you're doing today. And so you're you're probably doing this regularly, but if not, you know, do do take these terms and talk to the relevant practitioners and policymakers and see what they you know see how they respond. I mean, just in my own little micro environment here, I mean, I I get you know I, I see the value of these terms, decolonization, for example, you mentioned, but but it can be difficult. They 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 can they, those sort of terms they can in terms like that they can, they can sure they can bring people in, but they can also put other people off. Whenever actually these same groups have the same sort of common denominator, but the terms, the terminology gets in the way, and you know this is something we see in our work sort of every day. So you know, is is it is is it about you're trying to address kind of the structural barriers in a society? Then yeah, that, you know that's what decolonization is about, and many would agree with that, but they might not like the term. So it's something you know, it's just inevitable in our work. I think more in terms of practice, you're you're trying to find terms which are bridging terms, trying to bring people together rather than doing the opposite. And I'm so glad you asked that question. Sander? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth and David, for, for joining us today. For everyone who has other International Day of Peace activities today, hopefully they, they make you think less hard than, than this one. Feel free to read through the links that we sent you tomorrow. We have a Thursday talk next week. I shared the, the link in the chat. I was telling Ruth before we joined, we had 250 people from 75 countries RSVP for today's session. It's really great to see each week, you know, so many people from so many backgrounds, from so many fields join these sessions. If you have work that you'd like to share with the Connexus community, 
please reach out to host a Thursday talk. We they can be, I mean, basically any basically any Thursday. So please reach out if you have follow up questions for our speakers. Please feel free to to reach out to them. If not, we'll share the the slides, the recording, all of that as soon as we can get it edited. But one more time, thank you so much to both Ruth and David for for joining us today, and for all of you for for joining the conversation as well. Thank you, Xander, and, thank you, and thanks for access. Thanks, everyone.